I'm Libby Jackson. I work at the UK Space Agency and I'm the Human Exploration Program Manager. What that means is that I'm a civil servant, work for the government, and it is my job to make sure that the UK gets the best it can from our investments in human exploration. From Tim Peake through to the science experiments and the scientists up and down the UK who are doing those experiments on the International Space Station and in facilities around the world, uh, through to the in industry who are building uh, these things, including things like the Lunar Gateway, the small space station that's going to be out near the moon in the coming decade. I have always been fascinated by human spaceflight, right from when I was a, a, a young girl. Um, but it took me quite a while to realise that but maybe this interest of mine um, could actually be a job. It wasn't until I was in my teenage years that I found out that the UK has a space sector, that we, that we manufacture satellites. And after I did degrees in physics and then in space engineering, uh, I tried to get a job in that sector. And I was uh, able to get a graduate job at a company uh, called Airbus, working as part of a team um, that was going to install a mission control center for satellites here in the UK. And I thought that was amazing because um, I have always been fascinated by human spaceflight and particularly mission control. So to, to work in that area was a dream come true. But I kept my uh, eyes open, I, I kept searching and I discovered that Europe was going to be a part of the International Space Station. And uh, so I, I did nothing more than, than look for jobs online. I applied for them and I was able to get a job uh, working in Munich at ESA's Mission Control Center for the ISS, where first I was an instructor and then I became a flight controller and then finally a flight director. So I was in mission control, working with the astronauts, working with the scientists and the experiments, um, just like you see in the movies every day handling problems, making sure that the uh, space station kept running the way it should. Um, and it was a, a dream job, absolutely amazing. Um, some people say, so why did you leave that? Why, why are you um, now at the space agency back here in the UK? And my path here um, really was following Tim Peake when his flight assignment got announced back in 2013. Um, I really wanted to be a part of that mission. And um, when there was an opportunity uh, to work for the UK Space Agency running the education program for his flight, um, I knew that I, I wanted that job, I jumped at it. So I, I applied for the job, um, was over the moon when I got it and spent uh, two or three very intense years putting together and running the program of activities um, that supported Tim's flight here in the UK, uh, where we reached um, over two million children um, in one in three schools across the UK, um, using the power of space to really open their eyes to the excitement of science and engineering and the amazing range of opportunities that exist in the space sector. And so my message to you today really um, is that if you are interested in space, there absolutely is a job for you. And whether you're interested in space or not, the key I think um, to success, to, to doing things in life is to do the things that you enjoy. If you do the things you enjoy, you'll do them well, um, you'll smile. And by doing that, you'll find your way through life um, and your path that leads you to do the things that, that you perhaps never even dreamed could be possible. Um, thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Dr. Sarah Casewell and I'm an STFC Ernest Rutherford Fellow at the University of Leicester. So I research the irradiated atmosphere of brown dwarfs and I'm an observational astronomer. And what this means is that I travel the world and use eight meter or four meter telescopes to observe stars, quite often the stars that nobody has seen before. So I did my undergraduate at the University of Leicester and then I stayed to do a PhD in brown dwarfs. And my research now has taken me to looking at the atmospheres of brown dwarfs and what happens when you heat them up. So a brown dwarf is a failed star it's a star that forms essentially from the collapse of a big gas cloud, just like a star forms, but there's never enough mass to get squished enough together to start igniting the hydrogen to helium and to create the burning that holds the star up. So once these are formed, they simply cool and fade away. They're physically about the size of Jupiter, but with up to 70 times as much mass, and they have temperatures between about 2,500 Kelvin and 500 Kelvin. So they're pretty cool for a, for a star-like object. And they have molecules and clouds in their atmosphere. And these clouds mean that you can get weather as the clouds 
move away and around the brown dwarf and as they come and go with time. And this weather, these sort of star-like objects with weather were one of the things that really attracted me to brown dwarfs in the first place and they still absolutely fascinate me now. So my advice to you would be, if you want to be an astronomer or to work in the space industry, definitely go for it. Don't let anybody tell you that it's not for you or um, you need to be a certain type of person to work in the space industry. That's not true. As long as you're keen, enthusiastic and willing to learn, just go for it. Hi, my name is Philippa Davies and I'm a propulsion engineer at Reaction Engines in Oxfordshire. Reaction Engines is a company that is designing and developing engines for hypersonics and space access. Our engines can travel at five times the speed of sound in air breathing mode or up to 25 times the speed of sound in rocket mode for space access. I became interested in space after a family holiday when I was 10 when I got to go to Florida and visit the NASA's Kennedy Space Centre. I got to see the International Space Station travel overhead that holiday as well as a space shuttle re-enter. It was really exciting and I wanted to become an astronaut. Um, and my enthusiasm for the industry has led me on the path to where I am today. I decided to go to university at Southampton and study aerospace engineering. I then took a job on the graduate scheme at Rolls-Royce for joining Reaction Engines about seven years ago. I didn't know any engineers, however, and like you, may find the industry a little bit overwhelming. So my advice would be to contact companies uh, that you're interested in, apply to their work experiences, internships, apprenticeships, or graduate schemes, wherever it's appropriate for your age, and take the opportunity to speak with people directly and give it a go to find out what interests you most. And don't be afraid to take on work experience beyond school um, when you're in higher education, because the opportunities are still there and a great chance to meet different people, see different companies and find what you like. Hi, my name is Vanita Morahamadil and I'm a space engineer and I focus on operations mainly for human spaceflight and robotics. And I've always been interested in space and I remember being young and in the library and trying to find every book that I could about space. And then one of the books that I was reading among the images of space shuttle astronauts and NASA missions, I saw an image of a woman with brown hair in a spacesuit and there is a British flag on the arm of the spacesuit. And the caption next to this image said that this is Helen Sharman and she's the first British astronaut. And I think for me, in that moment, I knew what I wanted to do and that was to become an astronaut like Helen Sharman. Um, and she really became a role model to me and she showed me that my dreams are possible. So here is a woman who was born in Sheffield and beat 13,000 applicants to become the first British astronaut. Um, and I was lucky when I was young. My parents and teachers really encouraged me and supported me. Um, my parents took me to the National Space Centre and science museums and um, really cultivated that interest. Um, and I told my physics teacher in year seven that I wanted to work in NASA's mission control. And he really supported me um, and really encouraged me to do that. And, um, and then 12, uh, 12 years later, I actually achieved my dreams and worked on um, International Space Station operations in Germany's answer to mission control in, in Cologne. Um, so I was really lucky to have had that opportunity. Um, so but when I was young, I knew I wanted to be an astronaut, but I didn't know how to do that. And so I printed out the NASA astronaut guidelines and I stuck these inside cover of my secondary school folder. And they said that I needed to have a degree in STEM, so it's like science, technology, engineering, and maths. Um, and so I ended up studying physics, um, and whilst I was studying physics in uh, King's College London, I heard about a fantastic organisation called UK SETS, and they're the UK students for the exploration and development of space. Um, and whilst being involved with UK SETS, um, I think space really became attainable to me rather than just a dream. So I met space engineers who were working in operations for the first time, and um, even somebody that I ended up working with later on um, in, at the German Aerospace Centre. So I think it's a fantastic organisation to get involved with if you're thinking about a career in the space industry. Um, and as I, was, as I was going along this journey in space, I realised that there was something more. And I, um, so I started a website and platform called Rocket Women, which inspires young women um, to study space and STEM and STEM um, and consider STEM in their, in their careers. Um, and so the website contains information about scholarships and also educational resources. 
But also throughout my career, I've been lucky to be inspired by so many amazing women throughout that journey. And I really wanted to create a platform for them to showcase their stories um, and make sure to make sure their voices were being heard. Um, so definitely check that out if you're interested in a career in the space industry. And I think that there is such a big impact that you can make with a degree in STEM. So I think you don't have to go into the space industry, but I think it's really important to consider that only 12% of all engineers in the UK are female. And I think um, we really need that diversity and talent to solve the really hard problems that we have, especially in the world today. So I think it's really important to consider the impact that you can have with a degree in STEM, not only in the space industry, but um, elsewhere around the world. Hello, my name's Sue Nelson and I'm a science and space journalist. I work in radio, TV, podcasts and also writing print online and also books, which is why I've not so subtly got a copy of my book up there, which is Wally Funk's Race for Space. Now, in terms of being a journalist, my route was via a science degree, but I know people have become space journalists or specialists without necessarily having a degree in the subject so that's not you know always a given um, but it's definitely helped me my degree was in science uh, was in physics actually it was physics and I went from physics to the BBC as a sound engineer uh, they call it a studio manager basically what you do is you are working behind the scenes in a radio studio operating all the equipment and it wasn't the job for me so lesson number one if you don't get it right first time, don't worry about it. It all works out in, in the end. So I sort of realised after a couple of years, this was not the right job for me because I was much more interested in what the producer was doing, what the reporter was doing, what the presenter was doing than the sound quality, which made me a probably a lousy studio manager, but it did set a little light bulb in my head going and I decided to resign and become a journalist and my aim for doing this was to do a postgraduate degree that's why I thought right I will do that learn the trade and then change career and become a, a journalist I'd always loved writing so I'd written for a student magazine um, which was really helpful. I'd volunteered um, and got certain little pieces published that were book reviews or little ideas and things like that. So that was always there, a little hint that it would be the right career for me. And also as somebody who now broadcasts for a living, again, the signs were there. I'd always been interested in writing, in drama, and performance so and it, it is effectively if you're particularly if you're a broadcast journalist it is a lot of it is about performance so my advice would be don't worry if you're not 100 percent sure you can find your way there eventually um enjoy talking to people but enjoy listening to people it doesn't work if you don't listen as well be a stickler for detail you have to know your facts make sure they're they're right, correct, go over. The best writing, as they say, is rewriting, and that's definitely true. And you can never be over-prepared. And if you really want to be a journalist like me, I know these are tough times, but be a multimedia journalist if you can, because by doing all those different media, you A, get to do lots of different things, whether it's making short films for the European Space Agency, which I do on missions, or the James Webb Space Telescope, or podcasts, or audio, what have you. But that way, it means that you will always have a good area of work to, to fall into. So yeah, be a space journalist. It is a brilliant, brilliant job.